they go. So now we have the great pleasure to welcome Andrew Moir from Hispavonda. Hi, Andrew. Hi, hi. Thank you so much for being available during, uh, for making this presentation. Uh, so Andrew will make a presentation, as you can see, which will focus on how to go paperless using Android app in Rwanda. And the good news is that Andrew, after this presentation, will stay a little bit with us to reply to all the questions that you may have about uh, Android app, uh, whether it's in Rwanda and this particular project implementation, or whether it's related to your own context. So Andrew has promised to stay with us um, at least until 2 to 30. So please do not hesitate to ask any questions that you may have. In the on Slack, we have created this channel uh, called Experts Lounge for Africa that you that you most of you uh, already know. So ask all your questions there, and Andrew will be more than happy to reply um, on Zoom. And then just to say before Andrew starts that tomorrow also, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Oslo time, we have also the great pleasure to welcome Pamod Amarakun, who is one of the leaders for his Rwanda, who will be um, with us to present his, uh, his project on nutrition in Sri Lanka. So this is the same for all of you based in Asia. Uh, we hope, and the others uh, as well, of course, we hope you will be able to join to join us to listen to Pamod as well. So now I'm stop. I will stop talking and I'm giving the floor to Andrew. Thank you so much, Andrew, and I'm sure your presentation will be very interesting as usual. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um. Uh, thank you, Alice, and uh, thank you, the Academy organizers. It's a it's an opportunity for us to really present the the work that we always do in the at the field and. Uh, I also, I would like to take opportunity to appreciate the efforts from the participants from the day one up to the, I think today is day four. So uh, my presentation will not uh, will not take long uh, because we'll be focusing much more on COVID, how we went paperless using the Android app that we are learning now because I like the, the title of the academy in the implementers, implementers. So I think this is the, the, the core of implementation of the Android app. So without taking long, um, <clears throat> I, I think Rwanda, like many other countries, we we had an emergency situation or period where the, we had the country uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle of COVID and the, the government really established the national coordination structure to ensure that uh, we have all my disciplinary team together in a way that uh, if there is any action that is needed, it takes a little time. So here is the coordination structure of COVID. So I'm trying to give the overview of what we did in Rwanda. So you can see that we have, the, this is the what we call command post and I was part, part of command post. In the command post, we have uh, different cells. We have epidemiology operation cell. We have administration logistics cell communication cell and on my right side we have the planning cell so uh, without reading every step but uh, you can see on epidemiology operations cell we have the part called data management this is the part that we are dealing with the digitalization of all covid processes services and also ensuring that the laboratory uh, uh, distribution of results takes a little time as possible per standards so this is the part of epidemiological operation, the part of data management, which was data science and IT solutions. Our main role was serving all these surrounding uh, interve interve interventions like inv investigation team, contact tracing, laboratory treatment centers, rapid response, and then decision makers. Because you know, at the end of the day, uh, whatever intervention or action we take was really uh, were supposed to be evidence based. Um, so this is the flow for early detection of cases. Um, it, it's straightforward. Like I think even other countries, it's like this. First of all, was testing the suspected cases. So 
uh, was testing, then when you, we suspect you, you, you are either isolated and quarantined. Then when you are confirmed, automatically we send you to the treatment center. I, I, I mean COVID confirmation. Then uh, immediately we were supposed to do contact tracing and we, then we test whoever were in contact with you. Then we do the follow-up, then we put you in the quarantine. In the case we see you have some symptoms, then we again test, then you, we, when you are positive, you, you, you are transferred to the treatment center. The whole floor were, were really manual and there was a, an urgent need of automating the process. So this is the current status for Rwanda, uh, but uh, I took the status on 23rd. Uh, you can see that uh, there is a variation of COVID cases. It had been reducing previously, but now it's increasing. We, 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 I think on 23rd, we had 61 cases. Then you can see, but even the recovering, uh, we have high recovering, 90% of patients, they, they are recovered, which is good. But uh, since we started um, up to now, we have 47 deaths due, due to COVID. So coming back to my presentation, as I said, you, uh, this, is what, uh, we, this is what we had, uh, the manual process uh, uh, on the overall uh, early detection of the, of the patient or cases, the process was really purely manual because uh, a, a, during the testing, people were supposed to print uh, the whole of this batch of papers and uh, take them with, the, with these tubes that uh, have some um, liquids for COVID. So imagine having like, uh, you are testing like 5,000 people and you have to have 5,000 uh, papers linking them and you have to also compare the two tubes and the papers. So uh, I remember it was even hectic for us to, to, to try to trace, like if there is one case that they need us to trace. So it was not easy for us to trace them. So this was a problem. And another thing was that, uh, uh, even these papers, we are putting our health workers at risk. So imagine people that uh, in emergency in interventions when they get sick, and it could even affect the overall flow. So that's why the government said, no, we don't want these papers. How could we move without papers? So uh, the whole process, uh, I'm pretty sure you are seeing it. The whole process was like this. We have this middle. You can see these middle stickers. These middle stickers were used to, to put the lab ID and just stick it on the tube. So they have to stick the, all of this tube to, with you, unique lab ID for Andrew, unique lab ID for Jimmy, unique lab ID for Mata. So that was, was really manual. It was a process that used to take long and uh, it, was even, uh, it was even affecting the overall um, distribution of results. So the turnaround time of results. So uh, you can see the batches of paper also there. Uh, everything in the lab was uh, linked to the papers because the papers were even, the, these are case, case investigation uh, forms, but they were also like uh, a registry. So um, uh, as soon as they asked us to really um, stop these papers, we went to the laboratory and we tried to review the process. You can see this was the process from the laboratory, imagine, the sample collectors were supposed to take the papers from uh, this flow one. Then from there, they have to, to, to write on the tube and they bring the paper with the tube. Then at the laboratory, they have to put the lab ID manually on the paper and the tube. Then after even the processing, then the testing, they have to come back and link the tube with the paper, something like that. It was nine flows. So I think this is a good, a good experience after you learn, after the session of the Android Implementers Academy, always before you implement your digital solutions, always uh, try to review the process and try to see if the overall process could not be reduced by the technology. So what we did was to review the process it was nine, uh, uh, nine steps that one sample for Andrew undergo in the laboratory. And this one uh, were really affecting the the, the, the results return because uh, we used to have like one week when the result is still undergoing the process. So what we did, uh, the, these are the challenges with the, the manual process before digitalization. It was very long with unnecessary flaws. You can see it because there are some parts that it was good that the tablet could be doing it like 
the ID, sample ID. It was difficult process during specimen processing because you know even the health workers were not happy with the process. It was hard to trace urgent samples. I remember they used to tell us that this person, we need to know his information, his clinical diagnosis. Then tracing one post person out of 5,000 people, it, it was a hectic and you had even to take the whole day, the whole night, just searching for one person. So um, the, the, the other one that I didn't like, it was the manual process of lab ID. So imagine writing unique ID from one to 5,000. So writing manual with, with a pen on the sticker, then you have to stick it on the tube, you have to stick it on the paper. So it was really, you have to write two, two stickers, then you stick it on the tube, you stick it in the paper so that you could be able to link the two. So the turnaround time, as I said, it was, uh, it was also affected because it was, uh, it was a very long one. You, you can imagine because if everything is in manual, it you have to affect the time. So time is always linked to the processes and the, and, and the manual works. So of course, definitely delays of the results. Uh, then much work, it was putting on so much work to the lab technicians. So from sample collection to the result return. So all of this, the, 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 the leadership said, the Ministry of Health leadership said, no, we, we need to have a, a, a digital way of doing it. So that's when we came in and we, after looking at the processes, we said, no, for us to have everything done, we could reduce the process. So we said we could only remain with three, three steps. Then the remaining, because you know it was nine steps, now we were suggesting to remain with three steps. You can imagine we are, we are cutting off other six steps. So six steps, we are, cut, we are removing them in the steps because it was going to be integrated in the overall digitalization, the process, the tablet. So the, the suggestion was like this, the adjusted flow in the laboratory. It was sample collectors going to the field or going to the health facility with the tablet. Then this one replaces the other, the other manual form. Then we just customize the tracker. Then we put, we just link it with the Android app and the, the tablet. So from there, the tablet could be able to do the remaining work that was done at the laboratory, like assigning the unique ID, uh, the diagnosis, then that one was also sorted. So from the lab, they only take the tablet, then they check the code that was generated by the tablet, then they just process the sample, three steps. So after doing that and customizing, because we were lucky that the overall, uh, there was a global initiative of um, COVID module. So we just took that COVID module and we just to customize it or contextualize it based on the random needs. So we just linked it with the tablet. From there onwards, this was the, the form of, of sample collection that was turned into the tablet uh, registry. So these were the, uh, I think you're familiar with these ones. These were the modules that were customized in the, in the, in the system. We had the clinical exam and the diagnosis. We have lab request. We have sample uh, reception and sample processing. And what we did was just assigning the user groups and uh, the users. So it was like sample collectors, they had their forms. It means they, they had access on the modules. Then there are other modules that were accessible to only laboratory team. So are they, when you're going to, the sum, to, to sample collection, it was not possible for you to see the lab modules. So that's how we did it. So you can see that we have the confirmed cases, we have the COVID rapid test and uh, hospitalization and health outcome. So this is how it, it, it was after customization and we started and we took the, the, the decision of stopping the, the manual sample collection. You can see people when they are collecting samples, they have the tubes, then they have the Android app in the tablet. Then what they do when they create you, the system automatically generated the unique ID that they put on the, on the tube here. So it means they only bring the tube and the tablet. The tablet is for the, for, the, for the sample collectors, but they only bring the tube to the lab. So the lab people, what they do, they just check the code, the unique code that was generated by the tablet and synchronize in the server. So um, you can see here, my sisters and brothers, they are collecting the samples. You can see that everyone has this, the sample. You can see that my sister here is writing the unique code that was generated by the, 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 the tablet. Then you can see the rest are also busy 
feeling on the tablet. So this one was really so fast because as soon as you feel at the ground, automatically data was synchronized to the lab. So they could be able to see it on the dashboard that uh, we have this sample that are coming. Then as soon as you reach a reception, they could be able to see uh, the, the, the samples. So uh, the sample reception, what they were supposed to do, they had computers. They were just supposed to go into the system. Then they search the person, then they find it's Andrew, then they fill the rest of the information for Andrew. Automatically, that one could, was really very easier because you know searching on the computers was faster than searching on the, on the, on the papers. So on the sample processing workstation, these are the people. So as soon as everything is sorted and uh, checked from the sample reception, because at the sample reception and processing, they, 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 their role is to receive samples and check if the sample they are corresponding with their ID in the system. Then again, checking if the sample they are of good quality before they are processed. Then in the processing, they start the extraction. You can see that here they start the extraction. And this one was really faster because you know there was no paper works on it. So this is how the system generated ID looks like. You can see that it generates this ID, then they just bring the ID. The good, uh, the beauty of this one is that uh, one to reduce the risk of confidentiality because the tubes were only identified by the by the code. Uh, secondly, is that during the testing they were also using these codes. So this one also was a strength. So um, another one is the as soon as you simplify the process of the sample. Uh, as soon as we simplify the process of sample collection and uh, uh, sample processing, which was digitalized and uh, there was no paper, we also had the team that were all there to ensure that as soon as we have the results, the result is also entered into the system. So it was easy because the code was there, it was just entering whether the person is negative or positive. For the positive results, they, ha they had their own channel, but for the negative, it was automatic. So this is how we, we used to distribute the results. It was as, as soon as the result is entered, the client um, always get this SMS that say in two languages, Kinyarwanda and English, that uh, dear uh, maybe Andrew, please note that you are tested negative for, uh, for COVID-19 with the date. So, it, we linked the system with the uh, mobile providers gateways to ensure that at least as soon as the result is out, you get it. As soon as the result is out, you get it on your SMS. So uh, it was, it was uh, this one was, uh, it, it reduced the turnaround time because you know, uh, uh, it was very easy to, 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 to have results. As soon as you get results, then people, when they are at home, they just get their results on their phones. But again, because we are preparing for the travelers, we had also to customize another way of results, which was sending results on their emails. So this one, uh, it's the, it's, you can see that it's the email that sends the result to my email, which is Andrew, then it gives you the attachment, which is a certificate. Uh, then another one was also having other, ensuring that every process is automated so that uh, we speed up the process because the aim was not only uh, automating the process of sample collection with the tablet, but also was ensuring that all process of COVID is automated. So we came up with a COVID-19 test result portal where you could be able to check your results online. So you, you just put your, we, uh, when we are, we are taking sample during the sample collection with the tablet, when they click on this lab request, automatically the system sends you the, the unique code, then that unique code is what you use on checking your results. So we also had the booking for COVID. If you want to be tested your book, then they give you the slot when you have to come so that we reduce the queue. Then we have also passenger locator form. Passenger locator form is that when you're traveling to Rwanda, uh, I know most of you will be traveling to Rwanda, there is a passenger locator form that you have to fill before you come. So this one is also linked with DHS2. So uh, this is the, the online portal. It looks like that, like, like this. What it does is that uh, you, you get the codes during the sample collection. Then that code, you use it with your phone number to access your results. So the beauty of this one is that uh, it pulls the data. It's not something that is saved into the portal. It's something that it pulls. Then as soon as you leave the system, it just it, it doesn't keep anything within the, 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 the portal. So we use the API. So we have this locator form, as I said, for the locator form, you have to put your, uh, you can see that you put your passport number when you're traveling to Rwanda, 
before you travel. Then when you put your travel passport number system will check if you ever filled this form. If not, it will ask you to fill it. So what we did was linking the locator, the passenger locator form with DHS2. So it goes to DHS2 and fetch the latest unique ID like we do in the sample collection. This one is also sample collection. So it goes and fetch the latest ID, which is lab ID or unique ID. Then it gives it to the passenger. Then as soon as the passenger uh, is in Rwanda, they will not again ask the same information from the passenger. They only take the unique ID and fill and fill the rest of information because everything is synchronized in the DHS2. So at the airport, you find the people there with the tablet. So what they do is just your unique ID, they put in, then they check on the tablet, then it, using DHS2. Then they just identify your information, then they fill the, they only take your sample. They don't again go through. So this locator form was really important in linking it with the DHS2 and the tablet. So this is how it looks like. We have DHS2 here API that are linked to all these um, uh, other system, COVID systems to ensure that we facilitate clients or travelers to have everything online. So um, uh, without, um, uh, without taking long, uh, this is the certificate. You can see that uh, we also managed to develop the, 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 the custom app that is able to print whatever entered online whatever enter in DHS2 into a certificate, into a COVID certificate. This was important when it comes to people that you're transferring from the hospital or you have people traveling, there was a requirement that they have to have a certificate that uh, shows that the person is negative. So in Rwanda, we are using the certificate that comes directly from DHS2 and it has been really serving well. And we have also on the borders, like drivers coming from the bordering countries, they also use the same certificate. So it was customized in a way that it prints the, 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 the personal information, then it prints your results. So it's, uh, it also sends the email at the same time. So this one was also another thing that was like innovation to, to DHS2. So what happens, uh, the, I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, many questions will be asking to me that, uh, how do you show that people, they are not really, um, they are not going and they make their own certificate, then they can be able to, to leave. Because, you know, if it's a certificate that is in PDF or any format, you know that there's some software that can be able to edit it and they keep the same font. So what we did is that we have uh, a scanning app that as soon as, and the scanning app is encrypted, you cannot scan our, you cannot scan our QR code with any app. So at the airport, the same tablet that they use for sample collection is the same tablet that you use to scan your certificate. So when you reach at the airport, they just scan your, 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 your certificate to see that uh, it's really the one that we generated from the system. So this one really served a lot because as soon as they scan it, they see your name, they see you uh, result, they see you uh, date of result. So in the case you change your name, the system will keep the previous name. It means if you change like it was my, for my it was my certificate and you change from Muhira Andrew to another person, the, the, when they scan, they will see Muhira Andrew because you cannot be able to change the QR code. So that one also really helped us a lot and we got some, uh, some of the cases, but uh, I think as soon as you, people see that you are able to trace if whether the, the certificate is not the correct one, it will also improve the, the process, the whole process of certificate generation. Um, this is what I was saying because, you know, uh, in the beginning, uh, it was really hard uh, to trace what is happening in the field. Uh, because, you know, uh, you can imagine, because, you know, sample collection was really growing and it was growing based on the cases identified. So you could imagine that if at night they get then find like five, 50 cases, they have to go and sample the contact tracing for 50 cases. If they identify three, so it was really hard to know that how many uh, samples that you are expecting per day. So what we did was uh, linking these dashboards. You can see that we have the monitoring dashboard in the reception, in the control room and the everywhere. So it was like people going to the field when they, they take the samples, this tablet synchronized, then the, the chart keep changing so that they know now we're going to receive like five, 200 samples. Then they could be able to request for extra support staff to come to the reception to ensure that there is no any delay. So this one also contributed a lot in terms of uh, sample processing and uh, reception. So 
we we have many workstations, and uh, and uh, I would like also to thank the Android team, uh, Jimmy and Martin, and the rest of the team. They've been really working with us from day one, from the beginning, because you know, as soon as we've been implementing, there are much things that we are changing, and in, and there, there was also urgent need of changing things and leasing versions and something like that. So uh, uh, this is these are the workstations uh, we we had in the country. There's a national reference laboratory that is using DHS2 from the sample reception up to the research distribution and certificate and whatever. There is a, a COVID testing site that also have the same. They have at the airport. Then we have at different borders, point of entry, isolation site, treatment center, hospitals, testing site for travelers, and some selected hotel exorcism. So we have almost 500 tablets that were in place, active then uh, around 200 smartphones that were also working. So uh, this one also could also encourage some of us that think that uh, you may have problems when you have many devices working. So in Rwanda, we have experienced this, that uh, the, the, the system is really working well when if, even if you have uh, 500 uh, tablets. The, another thing that I, I would also like to recognize is that the strength of tablet is that it works offline. So imagine people, they just go and collect data without uh, saying that there's no internet or something like that. So they work offline. So they can synchronize that anytime they want. So beyond uh, the COVID, we also had other IT solutions that the government invested in. There is this robot uh, with the aim of minimizing the risks to our, our health providers. But also we had also these bracelets that uh, they, they just put on your, they just put on you to ensure that uh, we wanted to promote the home-based care of COVID. And uh, it was just to, the purpose of stopping it. Currently, we don't have treatment centers. We have a few of them. We have like two, I think, if I'm not wrong, it's like three or four. But the rest of the patients, they are treated at home. They just put the, this bracelet, then they keep monitoring you when you're at, at home. They, it, this one also sends the SMS of either you have a problem or anything. So the lesson learned, uh, I hope I still have time. Uh, the lesson learned is that uh, uh, having a single uniform client or patient ID was uh, really a, a strength. It was good for us because uh, it was very easy for us to have a unified ID to, to really follow up with the patient uh, from the sample collection from when you were being uh, detected that you're positive up to the time you are in treatment center. Another one is that we reduced it, uh, the, the average turnaround time. It was around 11 hours, even more than that. But now the turnaround between 11 hours to one day, uh, but, but before now it takes 11 hours or one day, but uh, before it was even more than that, it was uh, almost a week. A improvement of Android versions. Uh, this one is a strength that I would like to, 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 to contribute to the joint team because we had uh, everyone on board in Vast of Oslo. So we kept changing the versions to ensure that it, it fits in the, in the field needs or user needs. Uh, so it was, we had also ground pressure to ensure that everything is improved in a little time. So um, I learned that working together is a, is a strength and this, uh, you, 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 when you, lead, you need to move fast, you have to bring everyone on board. So multidisciplinary team was really a, a best approach in emergence. Like we've been working with Universal Oslo, HISP Rwanda, HISP Uganda, global partners, government teams, everyone was on board. So that one was also a best platform to share experience and having things moving fast. So um, another thing is that uh, is not uh, I learned is that most of us were not um, <laughs> experts in, in lab, but uh, I, we managed it because it was it is not easy to implement in a new domain. It, uh, sincerely speaking, it was my first time to implement the lab information system, but uh, it was easy to build on the workload due uh, because people were looking at it as a workload. So it was easy for us to build it when people wanted something that could reduce the workload. Um, another thing is what I said, it's always good to review the process because my experience is that uh, people always run for the technology, uh, but uh, there's sometimes the need to look at the process because sometimes the technology could be good, but when the process is not really harmonized well, it could also affect the overall process. Uh, in the, um, okay, it was, uh, as I said, in this kind of emergency pressure, it's important to have a strong community like the one for DHS2. 
uh, we, if it was not a strong community like a district HS2, like you guys that are here attending this session, it could have not been easy because at least we had the global the global module that was in place. Then the module was was uh, uh, ready to be used by the countries. So it it really reduced the time of customizing a new uh, a new uh, COVID module. So um, another one is the collaboration and communication around the field and the central level team, user support and engagement. Then uh, it's uh, okay. What we did was also uh, another strength is that um, with DHS2, we managed to integrate all testing sites. We have more than eight testing sites. All of them, they are integrated into one system. It means the unique ID is generated from one system. So the different sites, they have tablets. What they do is just uh, synchronizing information in one system. So even though we have all these, but we also had the challenge. Uh, the challenge is that one that I said, it was a new domain of implementation with a lot of pressure. Uh, I could tell you that the beginning was tough because people were expecting us to have everything on, in place in just one day. I remember there's one day that we had, uh, we, we lost some of the information. So it's, it was, it is not a straightforward. So you have to stick on your vision. You have to stick on what you have, you started and you have to keep improving as you go. Uh, good enough, we had like a support from the leadership and they were saying that you have to go, even if you have this one, but you can prove from the other side. So um, our implementation was not smooth, that was not good. I remember maybe Jimmy had been working with Jim and the team. Uh, in the beginning, we didn't look at the specification of the server. So we ended up using the wrong server. So the wrong server was not really, the performance was not good. Then it ended up discouraging the users and the, 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 the sample collectors. But again, this one is very good. Always you have to monitor your initiative and ensure that whatever is not, uh, is not really making it to perform well, you just improve it. Uh, as I said, we had pressure because you know we, we were given like three days to have the paper stopped. So this pressure also made us to have this success. We, uh, again, uh, I thank the Android team because we've been pushing to have the barcode to be scanned from the field. Like instead of writing that, that, that code on the tube, we wanted to have the barcode written on the tube. We are now in the process of implementing it because we wanted to have the barcode readers that can be able to read the, the one that are generated by the tablet. So this one, uh, again, it, it, it was a challenge because of the codes have to be write written manually. Uh, at the lab, they, they limited the code. Okay, uh, in the lab, they wanted us to have six digits. And you can understand that the DHS2 generate more digits to be able to have them reshuffled and they have a unique ID. So we had to have six digits, then we keep changing the first letter and the, to ensure that, uh, but it's working well, but it's, uh, it's a, a local innovation. But I think in the future, we need to have a way that the system could be able to change and you could be able to limit the digits. Then another one is entering the results. Currently, it was manual because there was two, the, the COVID machines were new, but now we are working with the vendors to ensure that we connect them with the DHS2 and the process is really moving fast. And I think we are in the good process, in the good progress. So this is the question that most people may ask. The whole uh, success or the story, the whole process was implemented by this team. We had like six statisticians at the command post and we had nine IT programmers, we had data managers too, and we had his Piranda team that were also part of the, the, the whole process. So this is the end of my presentation and thank you for your time. And I hope I used my, I didn't go beyond the time that was assigned to this presentation. Thank you, Alice and Tim.